The presentation is given by Jérôme Ganon. I just uh, met him roughly a year ago, personally, but I admire his work already since many years, I have to say. <laughs> so he is um, mainly working in the field of immunology, and he started this uh, working in this field already very early um, when he did his master in Paris and his PhD as well in Paris. He worked already in these fields. And uh, then in 2000, he moved to INSERM in Paris, to this research institute. And since 2007, he is uh, the director, is one of the directors there. Um, uh, he got a lot of intention uh, with his work and he received quite a few prizes also. Among them are the Cancer Research Award from the National Academy of Science in France and the Galais and Breton Cancer Research Award also from the, for, no, from the National Academy of Medicine also in France in 2011. He invented the immunoscore, which somehow had a big impact on the whole field of immunotherapy. And in the past months or last year, I had the chance to hear many talks about immunotherapy. And in all the talks I listened to, he was quoted. So I think he impacted the field uh, tremendously. And I'm very much looking forward to your presentation, Jerome. Thank you, Germ. Thank you for the kind words, and thanks to Beat Lofer for inviting me also. Um, so first, my disclosure, I'm a co-founder of a, a, an immuno-oncology uh, company and, and chairman of its scientific advisory board, and uh, I'm a scientific advisory board and consultant for a few uh, uh, companies. Also recently, I, uh, now I have a gold uh, because I now have a golden dwarf <laughs> that I received yesterday. So I'm very proud of it because I got, just got married this weekend. And uh, I also have a golden wife since two days. So that's quite nice. I have to disclose that. And um, so I will start by asking a few questions. So what are the lessons that we have learned uh, since 15 years of systems immunology? in human tumors. And uh, is the immune system important at all against cancer? And how, how can we explain so different tumors in terms of their immune response and immune infiltration? They are hot and cold immune infiltrated tumors, as you will see. And um, this goes along with what is the definition of cancer? And, and the way you put the definition of cancer also affect or change the way you're doing research. And uh, back in 2001, the definition of cancer put in this very famous uh, review were six hallmarks of cancer focusing on the tumor cells. All cancer cell uh, centric based on the DNA alterations. And uh, uh, the idea was to change the definition and to say that uh, cancer is not only tumor cells isolated, but it's a complex and dynamic microenvironment in which tumor cells are communicating with the immune system. And it is the homeostasis between these two parameters that really dictates the progression of a cancer. And so uh, this renaissance, basically, of uh, uh, the, the tumor immunology came, I showed this slide uh, uh, earlier this, this morning, with the demonstration in mouse model that, with knockout mice, that uh, adaptive immunity, that some part of the immune system was clearly associated with immunosurveillance. What we focused on was human tumors. And um, my lab and many other labs also uh, demonstrated the importance of immune cells, the natural immune response that we have, the natural immune response of a cancer patient is essential. And we put this idea that uh, there is 
an immune, con what we call the immune contexture that is important for the survival of the patients. And we define the immunoscore, and I will tell you what, the, what it is, basically showing the major importance of the natural T cells that uh, we have in our tumors. And these T cells that are so important are now the targets of multiple immunotherapies. And um, I will come to that in a minute by a few examples. What has changed is really a change in paradigm and a change in how the, tr how the patients are responding to the treatment. Um, the classical chemotherapy or targeted therapies, there was a gain of a few months or a few weeks before the cancer was, uh, the patient was relapsing because of tumor recurrence, because of the adaptation of the tumor cell to the drug. And they are very famous drugs, very efficient, very powerful, as you can see, like the BRAF inhibitors, very targeted therapies that have fantastic impact, but unfortunately short term because a few weeks after the patients have relapsed and died. So the gain is very minimal. What has changed with immunotherapy is that the curves not only do a difference here, but most importantly, do a difference here. That is, this is the survival of the patient, so the long-term survival of a patient in a fraction, in a subpopulation, the subgroup of patient, they are benefiting from these immunotherapies for a long time. And we are now starting to talk about possible cures of cancer. And of course, the hope is to bring these curves up. And here are a few examples of antibodies that are targeting the T cells. So we are not touching anymore the cancer cells. We are reboosting the natural immune response. We are unleashing the existing immune response of a patient by antibodies directed against T cells that basically deblock T cells. They are so-called checkpoint antibodies, and these are the uh, uh, response rate of these patients of, of, of these antibodies. The most important thing not being the response rate, but being the long-term survival of the patients. And of course, this uh, in, in, in 2013 uh, was the breakthrough of the year cancer immunotherapy. There are many ways of targeting the T cells. Uh, you've heard earlier about um, the CAR T cell therapy. That is a way to uh, modify the T cells in such a way that they will recognize tumor cells with adaptive transfer of T cells. The FDA-approved drugs, anti-CTLA-4, anti-P1, PL1, are the checkpoints targeting their co-inhibitory receptor at the surface of the T cells. There are other ways. Now, there are new generation peptide vaccines. There are antibodies to boost the T cells or cytokines that can also do this type of job. And here are a few examples of the New England Journal showing the uh, large phase three clinical trials where basically you have a tail and a very long tail now because you have patients that are responding for many, many years. And this is the, the, an example of a metastatic melanoma patients. All these uh, are tumors that have totally disappeared after ipilimumab. This was still in, two, in 2011 when it was uh, found uh, something that the field, that the cancer field, was not appreciating yet because it was only on melanoma. But in 2013, the anti-PD-1 therapies were also uh, um, powerful in lung cancer. And then that was a real shift of, um, this is an example of an anti-PD-1 uh, treatment where you can see tumor disappearing. You can see here a massive uh, metas metastasis that is uh, disappearing after treatment. What's interesting is that in these responsive lesions, in these responsive metastases, now you can see this brown staining, basically the infiltration of cytotoxic T cells coming into the tumor to kill the tumor cells. So when I started to work on, on, this, uh, on this topic, what I wanted to do was really to try to dissect the complexity of cancer, uh, because I thought that, complex, that cancer was a very complex disease, and that because of um, the new technologies, the large-scale technologies, because of the uh, power of the bioinformatics and the computers, it was possible to really dissect the complexity, not focusing on a particular molecular pathway. And so we, um, in the lab, 
uh, try to dissect this complexity. Oops. And the first uh, uh, study that we published uh, back in 2005 in the New England Journal of Medicine was the analysis of um, the microenvironment of a tumor, the immune response of, uh, of a tumor, and trying to see the relationship between this immune response and early metastatic process. So basically what we analyzed was the presence of tumor cells inside the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels inside the primary tumor. That is a sign of early metastasis. And surprisingly to me, because I thought that I would find some, let's say, bad immune parameters that are associated with more metastasis, with more early, uh, 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 early step metastasis. Uh, that's not what we found. What we found was a protection, was the good adaptive immunity, and especially the memory T cells, and especially a subset of memory T cells, the so-called effector memory TEM cells, that were very strongly associated with the absence of this early metastatic invasion process and with the survival of the patients. And so we believe that this memory uh, uh, the capacity of the T cells is very essential. So we pursued this work and did a very uh, um, precise quantification of the immune response. And we published this study in Science where we quantify more than 6,000 immunohistochemistry on large cohorts of patients. Uh, so the primary tumors of these patients. And we quantify different types of immune cells. We quantify their density inside the tumors and looked where they were located. Because as you know, a tumor is not something homogeneous. It's very heterogeneous. And we took into consideration this tumor heterogeneity. And the surprising findings, so the curves are a bit small here, but this is basically uh, um, survival curves. So you can see here, this is a very long follow-up on these patients, more than 15 years of follow-up. Um, this is the disease-free survival before tumor recurrence. The top three curves here are the patients having a high density of memory T cells. What is striking is that the patients not only will not have tumor recurrence for 15 years, but is that it will happen regardless of the tumor stage. So even a tumor at the late stage, if, that pa if the patients have generated high densities of memory T cells, they will be protected. In the opposite, all these curves here represent patients having a low density of memory T cells in both tumor areas, the center of the tumor, the invasive margin of the tumor. All these patients will have a very rapid tumor recurrence. And again, whatever the stage of the disease, even a patient with a small tumor, an early stage tumor, that patients will not be protected and the patients will have a very rapid tumor recurrence and die if that patient had um, low densities of memory T cells. And so the new paradigm came at the time when we did the statistical analysis. So these are Cox multivariate analysis to test the strength of the parameters and the dependency of the parameters. And putting into the Cox model the strongest parameter, that is the T stage, so the tumor progression, the N stage, the lymph node metastasis, the tumor grade differentiation, that are the strongest parameters to define, to classify cancer patients. When we put together these parameters with the immune parameter, that is in fact the test that I will refer later to the immunoscore assay, uh, not only the immunoscore, the immune parameters are very strongly significant on the Cox multivariate analysis, but more strikingly, the tumors, the gold standard of the classification, the tumor progression, the tumor invasion, the metastasis, the tumor grade differentiation, are no longer significant and statistically dependent on the host immune response. And so we put this idea that there are important parameters, immune parameters, that are associated with long-term survival. And these are the nature, the type of immune cells, the functional orientation of the immune response, the density of all these immune cells that are within a tumor, and their location, because there are different areas in a tumor, especially the invasive margin, where there's, you can see here, the tumor cells, and all these dots are immune cells with a site of conflict between the, tu the progressing tumor and the immune response. And so, more recently, we were interested into the spatial-temporal dynamics of this, because as I said earlier, tumor cells are 
constantly changing. They are very dynamic. They are accumulating mutations. They are proliferating very rapidly. At each proliferation step, they are changing the genotype, the accumulating mutations, and phenotype. And the immune system is the same. The immune system, one of the main uh, point about the immune system is that it is dynamic, it is adaptive, and the immune system also constantly changes facing these changes of the tumor cells. And so we analyze large cohorts of patients at the T4 stage, knowing that the patients who reach T4 before being T4 with large tumor were T3 and before T3, T2, and before T1. So we know there's a kinetic, we don't know the delta time in between two, but we know there's a kinetic and a progression. And so we analyze these uh, um, immune infiltration, immune parameters, and we end up showing this immune landscape that I will describe in a minute. I will skip that just to say that we developed some bioinformatics software that we published in bioinformatics that you can use to visualize complex data sets. And um, so this is a human tumor. This is a colorectal cancer tumor. This is the normal epithelium. All this is the tumor. These massive tertiary lymphoid structures here are immune cells. And within the tumor, you can see basically all the subsets of immune cells. And there are many. Here we analyze 28 different subpopulations of immune cells inside the tumors. And this was done by uh, purifying uh, subtypes of immune cells. So for example, purifying B cells, purifying T cells, and then purifying subsets of T cells. There are many that have different functions. All those T cells have different functions with known markers that we can use to purify them. Uh, and of course, the innate immune cells like eosinophils, macrophage, mast cells, neutrophils, they are all present into the tumor microenvironment. And so we analyzed the genes that you can see here, the red box here, are genes that are overexpressed in a given subtype of immune cells. And we applied what we call here immunome to these tumors. So now this is the analysis of the immunome in human tumors. And you can see very, very, these are all the patients, different patients with, <coughs> with different patterns. These patterns translate into different survival, different clinical outcome with very different outcome. And we validated with these findings with other technologies and basically showed that there were three groups of genes that belong to T cell cytotoxic and Th1 that are subsets of T cells. To the B cell uh, family with MHC class 2 molecule and to a new subset of T cells that are so-called T follicular helper cells that basically make the links between the T cells and the B cells. And all those are very strongly, significantly different between group one and group two and are associated with different survival. Of course, these data were the generation of, comp of gene expression profiling um, and with deconvolution of gene expression. And so we validated these findings by doing really immunostochemistry chemistry on each of those cells in the patients, on large cohorts of patients, as you can see, more than 400 patients. Uh, and uh, quantify basically each of those cells by doing also triple staining to characterize more specifically specific subsets of immune cells. And so we end up with this landscape. So the height of the peak represents the density of a given immune cell subpopulation inside a tumor. So you can see networks that are the correlations between these immune cells. You can see the two colors here, the invasive margin and the density at the center of the tumor. And you can see cells that behave in the same way, cells that are outside of this network. And the major cells and the, the more dense cells that are present within a tumor. And then instead of plotting the cell density, we could also plot the hazard ratio, that is the impact of each of those cells on the survival of the patients. And there are very, very strong differences. The green peaks represent the good cells, when high density, long survival, and the red peaks represent the bad cells. And you can see that these old peaks here, red peaks, as the forest of red peaks, represent the adaptive immune cells, the T, the subsets of T cells, and the subsets of B cells. And so we believe that these tertiary lymphoid structures are important to shape this immune parameters that are important for the survival of the patients. And we have mechanisms to explain how to 
uh, uh, these cells enter into the tumor. So more recently, we were interested into the analysis of the subgroups of cancer based on the classical molecular classification of cancer. So either by microsatellite instability, either by mutation rate, so the hypermutated tumors versus the non-hypermutated tumors, or the methylation phenotype of the tumors that can distinguish subgroups of patients. But we can also analyze tumors as being subgroups of patients having different types of immune response with different immune cells in their tumors. And so we apply this immunome, and we have now each of the subsets of these uh, immune cells that are belonging to the innate immunity with the subsets of innate cells here, and uh, the adaptive immunity with the subsets of T cells, CD8, the cytotoxic, the T helper, CD4 cells, and the subsets of T helper cells. And we can see the patients having high density or low densities of each of those cells. And going deeper into the analysis of this, we make the links between these immune cells, and especially these T cells, that have the capacity to recognize foreign antigen and a very good foreign antigen is a mutated peptide, a mutation that can be immunogenic, that, that is not a normal uh, peptide, can very precisely be recognized by T cells, as long as it can bind to the MHC, the HLA molecule, and that the TCR from the T cell can recognize it. And so we did this analysis, complex analysis, with large exome sequencing data, RNA sequencing data, the prediction of uh, the missense, nonsense, frame shift mutations, the prediction of the HLA type of the patients, knowing the HLA type of the patients, we know the anchor peptide uh, that can bind to a given HLA, and given the mutation on the peptide, we can predict whether these can be recognized by T cells. And so we end up having now not only the mutation pattern, but the immunogenicity pattern of a tumor, the capacity of this mutation to translate into an efficient immune response. And when applying that, we can see that there are very different groups of patients with uh, uh, very different types of uh, heterogeneity and tumor cell uh, immunogenicity. That will translate, these are different subsets of immune cells that are either enriched in blue or depleted in yellow that will translate into enriched or depleted immune cells within a tumor. An example of that are the frame shift mutations that are uh, present in the subgroups of patients that have a DNA mismatch repair deficiency and they cannot repair frame shift mutation because they are lacking the enzyme that is repairing the frame shift. And so now these generate a lot of peptides that can be recognized by T cells because of these frame shift mutations. And indeed, we validated some of these frame shift mutations, and we used these artificial antigen presenting cells that have all many co stimulatory molecules that have the HLA A2 of the pay of, uh, uh, that can bind this uh, peptide, and we took one of the mutated peptides and stimulated the T cells of the patients. So we put this precise mutated peptide that the patient had into these artificial antigen presenting cells, took the T cells from the patients, and looked whether we can stimulate them. And indeed, we can. These are the negative controls and positive controls. And we can see that the patients have T cells that are specific for this particular mutant. Not only that, but I think for the first time, we can visualize an anti-tumor specific T cells against a neo-epitope, against a mutated peptide that you can see here with the different controls <laughs> inside a tumor. And um, here is the point. You have patients that are like this, with all these brown T cells, very high density, intermediate or almost no T cells inside a tumor. And when doing the immunoscore, that is the quantification of cytotoxic T cells in two areas, in the center and the margin, you have immunoscore 0, immunoscore 2, immunoscore 4. These translate into major differences in the survival of the patient. The patients with an immunoscore 4, full of cytotoxic T cells, will survive more than 15 years. 
The patients with intermediate immunoscore, immunoscore 2 will survive five years. The patients with low immunoscore, immunoscore 0, will die within two years. And so we asked the question, how can we explain what are the mechanisms behind this? And we found a few, some of which are specific chemokines that are produced locally to attract specific subsets of immune cells, and especially of T cells, inside the tumors. There are specific adhesion molecules that are important for the binding of these T cells to the appropriate place. Another more recent uh, uh, finding is that um, the local proliferation of the T cell is important to expand the pool of the good anti-tumor T cells. And this is mediated with one particular cytokine that is IL-15 that we found to be very important in these patients, in these human tumors. So we have patients like this or like that, cold tumors or hot tumors with strong immunoscore. And when you want to target with immunotherapy T cells, of course, it will make a big difference if you are a patient having this natural T cell immunity or if you don't have this natural T cell immunity. When you have drugs like these that are FDA approved now, anti-CTLA for PD-1, PDL one that are targeting T cells, you need to have T cells in your tumors. And nowadays, it's not yet used. Nobody know, nobody is doing anything to know something about the immune status of a patient. And these guys probably will need first a T cell priming, will need a vaccine, for example, to get the first initial priming of the immune response. Of course, biology is not black and white. There's many immunoscore in between and many different immune defects that we should take into consideration. So this immunoscore assay uh, is basically trying to go into the translational aspect of the research that we have done, trying to put in routine settings at the hospital an assay that will measure the immune system of the cancer patients. And the reason is because for any cancer, basically when a patient comes to the hospital, there are multiple ways and multiple uh, 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 parameters that are measured that all are tumor cell centric, that are all tumor based related parameters. Of course, the TNM classification to grade the tumor, tumor node metastasis, or multiple ways with the morphology of the tumor cells, with the type of cell, the cell or of, of origin, the stem like, stem -like cells, etc. The molecular pathway of the tumor cells, the mutations, uh, the chromosomal instability, all these classical driver mutations are taken into consideration. The tumor gene profiling, this is an example for colorectal cancer, but it's the same for any, solid, any other tumor. For the immunity, for the host immune response, nothing is done. We don't know anything about the immune system of a cancer patient. There's not a single assay done in a routine setting at the hospital today. So the idea behind the immunoscore is to try to have a simple assay to quantify the cytotoxic and, 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 and memory T cells, their density, uh, and have this done routinely. And the power of this classification, immunoscore classification, is shown here. This is 15 years of follow-up of the patients. Patients with immunoscore 4 have a high density here of memory, CD45 or the memory T cells. CT in the center of the tumor, IM in the invasive margin of the tumor. So the immunoscore 4 are high, 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 high for also for the CD8 cytotoxic T cells. And you can see 3 high, 2 high, 1 high, 0 high. You can see the direct relationship between the immunoscore of a patient and the survival of the patient. In this paper, we explain why is it that on a Cox multivariate analysis, we have this striking finding that the immunoscore not only remains significant on a Cox multivariate analysis, the bowel perforation remains significant, but the T stage, the end stage, the other tumor parameters are no longer significant. They are statistically dependent on the host immune response. And the comparison of the current uh, AGCC or ICC TNM classification with the immunoscore classification shows the following that immunoscore is extremely powerful, but that the, the way to classify cancer patients depends on the host immune response of a patient. Of course, the immune system doesn't care whether the tumor is a colon tumor, is a lung tumor, is a breast tumor. The immune system 
circulate throughout the body, can uh, uh, basically impact any tissue and can address any tissue. And so it is likely that this type of uh, parameters will be valid in any type or any subtype of cancer. And this is a meta-analysis I did of the literature since then, looking at the different subsets of T cells, CD8, TH1, TH2, TH17, Trx, different. Uh, and, and it is very clear that the cytotoxic and memory T cells that are here, most of the studies, this is the percentage of articles published or the number of articles published, 58 out of 60, show the good significant prognostic value of these cells in multiple different cancer types, more than 20 different cancer types analyzed. Just very recently, this is not published yet, it's, in, it's been accepted, but we did a study. We took the worst case scenario. Okay, we said, okay, let's see whether the immunoscore can predict patients having brain metastasis. And so we took patients with multiple primary tumors that all went into the brain to do a metastasis, and we performed the immunoscore on these brain metastasis, and this is the survival of the patients, high immunoscore, low immunoscore. You can see that even in brain metastasis, the immune immunoscore, the evaluation of the immune system, these adaptive immune T cells can predict long survival versus very short survival in the patients. So we initiated a, a consortium to try to push this into routine because it's a total change of clinical practice um, because there's nothing done about the immune system. And we asked the community to participate in several meetings. This is basically a routine assay where we are taking uh, uh, model tools that are available in, at the hospital, high, uh, scanners, uh, automate machines, high resolution scanner, and taking advantage of digital pathology, basically to quantify these images, to quantify these T cells that are within a tumor. And so we have now this assay where basically we are doing two simple stains with CD3, CD8 on two regular slides, two consecutive slides, and where the software detects the center of the tumor, the invasive margin of a tumor. This is validated by the pathologist, and then the software counts all the cells. And um, we have this ongoing effort. We receive the support, the moral support, but still good, of multiple uh, societies, cancer societies, and now um, there is 23 centers worldwide who are participating to this effort with uh, uh, big centers uh, currently testing on their cohorts the, the immunoscore. So basically we are quantifying these cells, these brown cells infiltrating the tumors. I show these slides to put, to put the point that these T cells having memory capacity inside the tumor are the reflection not only of what's going on at that time, the present, but also of the past. It is the reflection of the accumulation of memory T cells inside the tumor that reflects the good or not good priming of the immune response. So that was what happened in the past in terms of immune priming. And it also reflects what will happen in the future because all these tumors has, are resected and we are left with the circulating memory T cells that, are, that can control long term the survival of the patients. Um, so what I described you is this immune contexture, these four types of immune parameters that are important. The immunoscore basically takes into consideration these three first parameters, the type of immune cell, the density of these adaptive immune cells, and their specific location, their location in different areas of the tumor with some functional orientation of the re immune response that is essential. I discussed this continuum of cancer surveillance from the prognostic to the predictive to the mechanistic signature now that we have patients that are responding to these immunotherapy drugs where depending on the intensity of the response we can either see tumor recurrence or tumor control or tumor regression now with these efficient immunotherapies. And I hope that the future will be to use these immune contexture parameters will be to put some immune parameters, including the immunoscore, into cancer classification to know something about the immune system of a cancer patient. Of hopefully to use these immune parameters as predictive tools to evaluate and to know which will be the patients who will respond to immunotherapies, because again, it will make a big difference if a patient have or does not have this natural immune response that can be unleashed by immunotherapy. And I hope the near future 
will be to analyze the immune contexture, the effect of a patient, and to adapt the new immunotherapy strategy to these patients' immune defects. And with that, I'd like to thank all the people in the lab uh, who did the work, to thank also uh, a very strong uh, collaboration I have with a group of uh, bioinformaticians in Austria, and uh, to thank all the clinical um, colleagues, and of course to thank the 23 centers worldwide who are participating to this immunoscore effort, and the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer uh, uh, in the U.S. who is supporting this uh, activity, and I thank you for your attention. Jerome, thank you so much for, for this exciting talk. I guess there will be quite a few questions. Yeah, please. Um, you brought up very, very nice talk. You brought up brain right at the end. And have you looked at the difference between the resident immune system, say the microglia in the brain and the morphological change versus, or the morphological difference versus the T cell, invasion of the T cells? Mm -hmm. Um, not yet. What we have done is the, so is, is the analysis of brain metastasis that could be different from uh, brain primary tumors, glio, right. glioblastomas, uh, uh, which we have not yet analyzed. I know that some people are currently analyzing the immune response in, in glioblastoma and other brain tumors. Um, so I cannot properly answer the question. But clearly, in brain metastasis, there is a clear attraction and infiltration with let's say external T cells that are coming from outside, that are new T cells, and the density actually can be quite high. The density inside of T cell, inside a brain metastasis, can be very, very high, depending on the, the patients and depending on the, the immune response. Uh, excellent lecture. You show really a very nice correlation between the density of the T cells in the tumor in the brain or any other places, I guess, and the uh, survival. The question is, can we make use of it and try to find a way to really mobilize T cells or try to force T cells to move more to this area, and there, then we can utilize all these wonderful therapies that are based on the T cells and have a much increased the survival of most patients. And mm -hmm. then, you have the best of all worlds, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, there, are, there are multiple ways of, of manipulating the, the, the immune system, multiple ways of manipulating the, the T cells. Um, uh, for sure, being able to attract them at the right place yeah. will be essential. Um, there are ways to, let's say, indirect ways uh, of doing that. And we know that some therapies, uh, like that are not considered immunotherapies, are in fact modulating a lot the immune response. As an example, radiotherapy. We know that radiotherapy is also boosting locally the adaptive immune response. And it's a way to, to, to give stress signal to release cancer antigens that can now be seen by the T cells. And we know that this is one of the way to uh, uh, let's say in combination with other types of immunotherapies, can modulate the immune response. And we could take other examples of this. Um, so, so, yeah, I think it will be essential to, to, to be able to mobilize the T cells uh, uh, there. Also to deblock T cells, and this is what has been done with the checkpoints, is these yeah. T cells that are within a tumor are in um, immunosuppressed environment mm -hmm. And because of feedback loop mechanism, because the immune system is built in such a way that uh, it doesn't want to, to destroy our body. So to prevent autoimmunity, there are multiple ways of downregulating or, 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 or slowing down the, the activation of the immune system with these checkpoint receptors that are at the surface of T cells to inhibit them. And so deblocking by using agents, antibodies against these checkpoints receptor now you release basically the T cells and now they can be activated again. So there are many ways to manipulate the T cells in such a way that you can reactivate them without touching at the tumor cells. It's, it's yeah. really no, no. an immune, uh, uh, immunotherapy. This is direct immunotherapy. 
Thank you. So, very nice talk. A quick question. When you see an increase of the tumor, of the T cells in the tumor, did you check the T cell receptor usage? So do you have a kind of uh, association with a more oligoclonal or more diversity uh, expression of the different TCRs? Yeah. So we analyze the diversity of the T cells inside the tumors. So all these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, we analyze their repertoire. So by looking at the, the VDJ recombination of the TCR to evaluate the, the spectrum of the repertoire. Basically, it's very broad. There are multiple different subtypes of T cells. Uh, it's not a normal repertoire like you would find in the blood in the circulation. So it's a biased repertoire. So these T cells are different from the T cells that are present in the blood, although there are some common ones. Um, and, uh, and, and, and actually, it's not really surprising me now that we, we have so many data on, on the alteration of the tumor cells, not only the the, the mutations, but also there are multiple ways of inducing uh, uh, altered peptide, if that can be altered peptide through uh, splice variants, through uh, aberrant glycosylation, aberrant phosphorylation, etc., that generate peptides that are not normal, that can be seen by the T cells. And it's not surprising to me to see so many different T cells inside a tumor. Um, there is no correlation, and also not in the patients with a low immune score. It's also not a difference. Um, so, after treatment, these are very recent data, not from our lab, from uh, from uh, another lab here in Switzerland. Actually, um, they have analyzed now that we have successful immunotherapies. They have also analyzed the repertoire of the T cell before treatment and after treatment, and there's a mobilization of a totally new repertoire of T cells after treatment. So, you, so, so it's a very dynamic system that you can manipulate. The interesting thing is after you talk, I think now all the people in the audience developing nanoparticles for treatment of cancer have to re-evaluate their systems because we are always looking for materials which are biocompatible, so not activating the immune system. If your theory is true, and I'm 100% convinced because uh, there were some nanoparticles activating or creating inflammations and they had a much better outcome for the patients, I think now we we have to look for materials which are no longer so biocompatible, but causing inflammations in order to reactivate the immune system. Yeah, I'm, I, th I think nanoparticle is probably one way of manipulating the immune system. You just have to enter yeah, this into your models and, and to take into consideration that a cancer is not only tumor cells that you have to target, is, is the the, the progression of a cancer, the metastases of a cancer are directly dependent on this microenvironment, on this dialogue that is constantly present between the tumor cells and the immune cells, and they are exchanging factors and et cetera. So it's possible, very likely, to take advantage of nanoparticle to target immune cells as well. Thank you for this very, uh, this very important work and these strong data. Is the humoral immune system and the B cell just that? Is it irrelevant in, in cancer in your data, or is there another future for, uh, for antibodies? No, I, uh, so as I said, we, we analyze, let's say, with the least biased way possible, all the cells present into the microenvironment. Then we focus, let's say, on the cells that are the strongest impact and the strongest correlation with long-term survival, et cetera. And the strongest ones were the cytotoxic and memory T cells. So that's why we developed later on this immunoscore assay with, that we wanted to be a simple assay with two antibodies directed against these T cells, which doesn't mean that the other cells of the immune system are not important. They are very important. And indeed, the B cells, and especially the B cells, these tertiary lymphoid structures that are surrounding the tumors, these human tumors, are full of B cells. 
and, 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 and our data support the fact that these B cells are, as well as the T follicular helper cells, making the link between the T and the B cells, are very important. Um, there are some, we don't know yet uh, in our patients, the, the impact of the plasma cells and of the, the antibody production compared to the B cell that, and probably the T cell help with the B cells. We still have to dissect this. Um, there are other data in mouse models, uh, um, but we, we really would like to, 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 to continue to deeply analyze these large cohorts of patients to really uh, make the point. So the B cells are clearly important, and also the innate cells are important. They are not as important for long-term survival, but they are very important locally in the microenvironment to modulate the immune response. So here, I have two questions. It is unclear to me what you are exactly predicting. Are you predicting with high immunoscore that if you treat the patients with immunotherapy, it, it, it will survive longer? Or independent, how do you treat or even not treat the patients, it will survive longer? So I, I would like you clarify this. And second, there is another uh, assay by nanostring is similar immunoscore. Can you explain what is the difference between your immunoscore and nanostring immunoscore? So, um, so the first point, um, what we have measured is the natural immune response of the patient. At the time of surgery, we analyze these tumors and we quantify the natural immunity with the T cells, the cytotoxic T cell density. This, independently of the treatment, predicts the survival of the patients. It is valid at all the stages of cancer patients. It is also valid at each of the stages. So if you take, for example, stage two patients only, that all have the same treatment, basically for, uh, for colon cancer, for example, no treatment except surgery. So these patients have surgery, go home with no chemotherapy, with nothing, because there's no recommendation. It's considered early stage. The density of the adaptive immune cells, the T cells, predict very long-term survival when high immunoscore 4, high density, or very short survival if low immunoscore. So this is prognostic. It's independently of the treatment. Now, as I showed, it is um, the, the immunotherapies that are now targeting the T cells will be very much dependent on the existing immune response of the patients. So we have data to support that different types of treatment are dependent on the existing immune response. And now we're in discussion to test these immunotherapy trials with immunoscore or other types of immune assays to really predict which patients will re are responding to this therapy. And the immunoscore being, the, let's say, the simplest assay, that is the quantification of the cytotoxic T cells inside the tumor, is a very likely will be a very robust asset to predict the patients that will respond to this therapy. There might be other parameters to take into consideration, but clearly the density of cytotoxic T cell is one, and there are already data now uh, coming up that shows this. So they are both prognostic and predictive. They are overlapping. This, these immune parameters are overlapping and are predicting independently of the treatment, the survival of the patient, and are predicting the likelihood of response to the immunotherapy, and maybe not only the immunotherapy, any therapy that can modulate the immune response, including anti-angiogenic therapies, for example, that is not only anti-angiogenic. For example, anti-VEGF therapy, we know as immunologists that the EGF can, there's, VEGF receptor at the surface of subsets of T cells. We know that DGF modulate the maturation of dendritic cells. So we know that there are direct impact of some treatment like anti-angiogenic therapies that modulate the immune response. So any treatment that can modulate the immune response will be dependent on the existing immune response of a patient. So they are both prognostic and predictive. So to come to the other point that was uh, the nanostring technology, so this is a technology that basically is quantifying the expression level of genes. Um, and so if you analyze immune-related genes, you can have immune signature that can not exactly mimic, but can give some uh, 
similar or related uh, results compared to the immunoscore. The advantage of immunoscore is that it's a uh, pathology-oriented technology, and since the classification of, of, of cancer is done by the pathologist, it's good to have a technology that they will use. Uh, it also takes into consideration, and I think this is an, an essential point, the architecture of the tumor and the location where these T cells are, and especially this invasive margin of the tumor where there's this site of conflict with immune cells is very important. This type of, uh, um, this type of assay can only be done with a technology where you have images and where you can analyze with image and digital pathology the location of a cell. If you analyze gene expression, it's a bulk of cells and an RNA that you don't know where it's where it was located inside the tissue. So it has advantages and disadvantages. Um, so, so I hope there will be many ways and many tests that will measure something about the immune system of a patient in routine, actually. So one last question. I will be short. Uh, so I'm just wondering if uh, some kind of immunity test on the healthy patient could uh, help that we, let's say, prevent cancer, that if you see that, uh, for example, some patient which already has a genetic predisposition, high genetic predisposition to have once-in-the-life cancer, could you check the immunity state while this person is still healthy? And then if you see that it's very bad condition, that uh, somebody can boost this immunity system and prepare the body, that in the case that cancer come once, that this person has then uh, let's say, big chance to have a higher immunity score than, let's say, without this mm -hmm. immune boosting. I mean, some kind of vaccine or I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, a few, three points. One is um, the, the, let's say, the polymorphism of the patient. Each one of us has different polymorphism, including on immune-related genes. So the large GWAS study uh, were not very successful in finding uh, immune parameters that are associated with, uh, uh, with increased likelihood or, or not. There are some functional assay, though, that were significantly associated with increased likelihood of having a cancer. This was a, an old study from a Japanese group. They took healthy donors, just the population, and they took blood from these, patients, from these donors and did a cytotoxic killing assay with the T cells, the peripheral T cells of these patients. And they rank these donors based on the capacity of the T cells to lyse, you know, T, you know cytotoxic in vitro assay uh, uh, to do ly lysing with granzyme B production, etc. And then they followed this population. And 10 years after, they looked at the cancer incidence. And the patients, well, now the patients who had cancer were the ones having the lowest capacity to generate a cytotoxic T cell response. So there is a clearly a functional assay that was linking, that, that make a link between the cytotoxic capacity of T cells that probably is related to genetic, you know, intrinsic findings uh, to cancer incidence. Now we can also manipulate this uh, now that we have potential epitopes that can uh, uh, stimulate T cells. And I, I'm thinking especially of um, groups of patients in which I believe it will be possible to do prophylactic vaccine if we can predict the hotspots of mutation, which happens in subgroups of patients having particular defects. So it's not for the whole population yet, but in subgroups of patients having particular defect, especially in um, DNA repairs in the DNA repair system, we can predict hotspots of mutations that are passenger mutations, that are not driver mutation, but these passenger mutations can be immunogenic. And if we can then predict the immunogenic mutation, one could do a prophylactic vaccine. And I think this will come in the near future. Okay. Thank you very much for this vivid discussion, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.